Hi, my name is Gary Tran. I'm a radiology resident at Henry Ford Hospital, and this is the RSNA case of the week on osteochondral lesion. This is a case of a 14-year-old male with no significant past medical history who presents with left ankle pain intermittently for the past year. He reports twisting his ankle about one year before, and he rates the pain as 8 out of 10. On the AP and oblique radiographs, there is a cortical defect and ovoid lucency at the medial Taylor dome, indicated by the black arrows. On the axial T1-weighted image on the left, there is a round, hypo-intense signal abnormality at the medial Taylor dome with a darker T1-weighted hypo-intense periphery, representing sclerosis. On the axial fat-saturated PD image on the right, there's a corresponding ovoid hyperintensity with a hypointense rim. Sagittal and coronal fat saturated PD images show surrounding bone marrow edema and a single small cyst developing at the OCD parent bone interface, which is best seen on the coronal sequence, denoted by the blue arrow. The final diagnosis is osteochondritis desiccans. There was a cortical defect and ovoid lucency at the medial Taylor dome on the radiographs and an ovoid T1 hypointense and T2 hyperintense signal abnormality on the MRI with surrounding sclerosis, bone marrow edema, and a cyst at the OCD parent bone interface. The top differential diagnoses include osteochondral lesion related to arthritis, osteonecrosis, stress fracture, and acute osteochondral fracture. For osteochondral lesions related to arthritis, there is usually increased subchondral sclerosis at the site of abnormality on the radiographs. On MRI, there is an area of bone marrow edema-like signal on T2-weighted images and ill-defined hypointense signal on T1-weighted images. There will be associated degenerative changes, including joint space loss, and osteophytes on radiographs and cartilage loss on MRI. Due to the patient's age and lack of osteoarthritic changes, this diagnosis is unlikely. For osteonecrosis, we should expect focal sclerosis of the Taylor dome on the radiographs. On T2-weighted imaging, linear high-intense signals are seen adjacent to low-intensity areas indicating sclerotic bone. This is known as the double line sign, and these findings are not seen on the current case. For stress fractures, we would expect cortical thickening or increased sclerosis along the site of fracture. Periosteal reaction and a radiolucent fracture line may be seen. These findings are not seen on the current case, and moreover, stress fractures of the talus are uncommon. And finally, for acute osteochondral fracture, on T1-weighted imaging, a hypointense line extending to the joint space is seen representing the subchondral fracture line with involvement of the articular cartilage. And on T2-weighted imaging, intermediate signal may be seen corresponding to the fracture line with surrounding hyperintense bone marrow edema. No associated contour abnormality should be seen on the radiographs, unlike in this case and is also unlikely given the absence of a history of acute injury. Now for some take home messages. The most common anatomic locations for osteochondritis desiccans include the medial Taylor dome, capitellum of the elbow, and medial femoral condyle of the knee. MRI can be obtained to assess the size of the defect for cartilage integrity, surrounding bone marrow edema, and for signs of instability. Instability in adult osteochondritis desiccans demonstrates T2 hyperintense rim or cysts surrounding the lesion or displacement of the fragment. In contrast, T2 hyperintense rim surrounding the lesion only indicates instability in juvenile osteochondritis desiccans if 1. The signal is the same intensity as the adjacent joint fluid or 2. It is surrounded by an additional T2 hypointense rim. Moreover, cysts surrounding a juvenile osteochondritis desiccans is only indicative of instability if they are multiple or larger than 5 millimeters in diameter. In general, stable fragments are typically treated conservatively with rest and immobilization and have good rates of recovery. 
Pediatric patients with open physis usually undergo similar management. However, operative management may be preferred for skeletally mature patients or stable lesions that are not responding to conservative therapy. Juvenile OCD are generally treated conservatively with immobilization and pretends a more favorable prognosis when compared to adult OCD, which more likely presents with instability. Unstable fragments are typically treated surgically due to the risk of developing early osteoarthritis if left untreated. However, secondary osteoarthritis may develop despite intervention. Early and aggressive surgical intervention for adult OCD includes drilling, internal fixation, microfracture technique, and osteochondrographs. And that's it. Thank you.